In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It feels very appropriate that today, on the first Sunday of a new call for me and my family here at St. Mark's, that I have the privilege of exploring these multiple call stories we heard in today's scripture. Now, if we're looking to draw immediate insights into what it means to be a person today called by God, as we all are in one way or another, we may be just a little disappointed. After all, there's not a lot in common between these stories on the surface, and the endings of these call stories can also seem a little depressing, but I promise there is good news to be found. We begin with Jonah and his call to preach to the Ninevites a message of repentance. Now, of course, Jonah's most famous call story is from his initial refusal to heed God's call. In the first chapter of this very short book, God gives almost exactly the same call as he does in the call today. Go at once to Nineveh, God says, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, as you well know, instead attempts to escape God's call, landing himself at the bottom of the sea, inside of the belly of a large fish. It's only after three days and three nights in this fish that Jonah finally decides to ask God for help. Three days before he would ask for help. But God, of course, listens to Jonah and delivers him and immediately reiterates this call to go preach to the Ninevites, which is where we picked up the reading today. So here we find Jonah, freshly spewn from the belly of a fish, going grudgingly to do what God has called upon him to do. He reaches Nineveh, the stronghold of the longtime enemy, enemies of the Israelites. The Ninevites, part of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, were the violent bullies of the Mesopotamian world, stopping at nothing to expand their empire. It was considered to be a place of great wickedness, of cruelty and violence and pagan gods. Everything the God of Israel was supposed to stand against. So no, Jonah doesn't want to be there. He was, after all, willing to sit in a fish's belly for three days rather than going there to those people. You might think of it as the equivalent of asking a Ukrainian citizen to go to Moscow and preach a message of repentance to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Jonah did not want to do that. And not only did he want the job, I'm willing to bet he didn't even think those people deserved to hear a good word from God. Now, I'm not sure who those people would be for you, but I know that we all have them. People you avoid like the plague, people you may feel are responsible for our societal ills, noxious governmental figures and the people who support them. I know I have those people. Whoever it is for you, it's, it's human nature to have people you'd rather not associate with, much less preach to. After all, if they listened, that might mean that we would have to associate with them, to learn to love them as God's children. Even if they repented and changed their ways, we might still not be satisfied. We'd say, maybe it's a show to curry favor. They must be up to something. You may remember that Jonah's story ends in a similar, if depressing, way. After following the letter of his call, if not the spirit, Jonah goes and preaches, as you heard, and the Ninevites do indeed listen to Jonah. Everyone from the king down to even the animals of Nineveh put on sackcloth and ashes. The king decrees that everyone should stop their violent ways and pray earnestly to God. Now, we have no reason to suppose that this was anything but sincere because we are told that God does change his mind and spares the Ninevites. Now, we don't hear the conclusion of Jonah's story today, but do you remember what Jonah does after this? He sulks. <laughs> he goes and he sits down under a tree and waits to die 
because he is so angry at God for being compassionate. He says to God, I knew you would do this. I knew you would do this to me. It's why I tried to run away in the first place. And we don't get a happy conclusion for Jonah. We never learn whether Jonah decides it's better to go and interact with the Ninevites who have repented, or whether he loses himself in isolation and self-pity in his refusal to accept God's unbelievable compassion for Jonah's enemies. I once had a family friend who was horrified that when I went to college, I was associating with someone who was an atheist. Mm -hmm. To her, this was right up there with communists and anarchists. But fast forward several months to when this person had a change of heart and became open to hearing God's word, started attending church, all surely things that we could celebrate as part of our calling as Christians to spread the good news. But when she found out, do you know what she said? She said, well, if you can't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, is, this is true. And I don't think that this was a particularly negative woman. I don't, I don't mean to cast shade at her. I think most of the time, she genuinely wanted to listen to God's call. But somehow, she had a little bit of the Jonah complex. She couldn't let herself accept God's goodness in this case. Now, if we take a look at these other call stories in our gospel account, the disciples Jesus calls begin with a more hopeful response than that of Jonah. Jesus also comes preaching a message of repentance and calls two sets of brothers who immediately stop what they are doing to follow Jesus and fish for people, a beautiful response to God's call. But we know how difficult it became for those men to maintain their willingness to immediately follow God's call without question, don't we? Most of them abandon their Lord, deny him, lock themselves away in fear after his crucifixion. So even when we try to follow God's call like the disciples, we all have a little bit of Jonah lurking inside of us, restricting our willingness to go where we are truly called, instilling fear of God's limitless compassion for others, infecting us with smugness and self-righteousness when we see sin in others that limits our abilities to live out our Christian vocations in the world, not living into the spirit of our true callings. So you might well ask, where is the good news in all of this? Are we doomed to be faithless, ineffective disciples no matter how we respond to God's call? No, not at all. There are two main things that give me so much hope for the possibility of how we might live out our Christian vocations in this world, wherever they may be. The first is that we don't really hear the full story of the calling of all the people who decide to listen to God's call in these passages. This is not to say we have nothing to learn from these stories, but I believe that the biblical examples of vocation we are supposed to imitate are frequently not lifted up for our consideration. Take, for example, the 12 disciples. Now we know that more than 12 people were following Jesus at any given time, crowds of them. We hear about the 12 who are sent out with a specific purpose, and we are grateful to them for spreading the good news in the ways they did, but they were not the only ones who answered the call to follow Jesus. Much, much later in this gospel account, during the crucifixion of Jesus, we hear again about some of the people from Galilee that Jesus called back in the first chapter of Mark's gospel. But it wasn't Simon Peter or Andrew or James or John. No, Mark tells us that during the crucifixion of Jesus, there were followers of Jesus who had stayed with him since his first days preaching in Galilee. They were the women who were watching from a distance. Mark says in Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there 
from these examples of women disciples, we see that it is not inevitable that our call stories end in failure to follow through or unwillingness to go where God calls us. It's more that these types of disciples don't always make the news. They are not in positions of power or authority. They're not making a scene trying to walk on water. They are tending to the needs of Jesus wherever they may find him in this world. They don't have time for dramatic arguments with God or flashy scenes where they try to demonstrate their faith so that other people will notice how faithful they are. They are simply doing the work that has been given to them to do. So I take great hope in the untold stories of disciples like these, knowing that they are still out there fulfilling their vocations in classrooms, in shelters, in hospitals, or any of the countless places where Jesus goes to be with the most vulnerable of our society. There's also a second place to find hope, particularly in the story of Jonah. Jonah tried everything to escape God's call. He may have been petty and grumpy and willing to sit down and starve rather than rejoice in the repentance of his enemies. But you know what the result of all of that was? An entire city repented of their wickedness. For that brief period of time, an entire city committed to doing what was right in God's sight. An entire city of God's creatures was spared from calamity and destruction. So I take comfort and hope in the fact that even when we are not faithful followers, when we fall short of God's call to us, still our God does amazing work through our worst efforts. That is really good news for us. So take hope, friends. Whether you are in a season of fruitful, faithful discipleship like the women from Galilee, or whether you are a grumpy prophet, prone to sulking, God still calls you. And God will somehow use you so that the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, no matter what obstacles you try to throw in God's way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.